I want to share with you today about what did Jesus say about faith? What did Jesus say about faith? And I want to, I wrote this down, saw this, and cute little thing, but I think there's a lot of truth in it. How many of you know what Wi Fi is? That's the thing that you can have either in a business or your house where it sends out a signal that connects you to the internet. And everyone in your house has a device, whether it's a phone or a tablet, um, where they can connect into that signal. And a lot of times it's protected by your code that you put in that people can't use it unless without your permission uh, that you have to give them that code. But I want to tell you something. God has given you the code to tap into what I'm going to read to you. Faith is like Wi-Fi. It's invisible. But it has the power to connect you to what you need. I'm going to say this two or three times because I believe you need to write this down. Faith is like Wi-Fi. It's invisible. But it has the power to connect you to what you need. I'm going to say it the third time. Faith is like Wi-Fi. It's invisible, but it has the power to connect you to what you need. Everybody got it? And you need it one more time? Okay. I encourage you again about tonight, 5 p.m., community prayer. Powerful time, I'm believing, tonight. And let me just say this, it's, it's not just prayer, we're worshiping and praying. That's all that connected together. It's a powerful time. This summer I've been doing a lot of teaching on faith. And all of them are on the website. If you have not been here, I really encourage you to get on the website, elsonrchristiancenter.org, and... Go to the place and you can listen to all of these messages, even with your coffee cup and your slippers on. Amen. Prophetic vision on the wall, faith rewards. I believe it's more than a religious cliche. It has substance to it. I want to say it again. Faith rewards. It's more than a religious cliche. It, is, it has substance with it. And God is a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. Today's word is to explain, even in Jesus' own words, about what faith is. And I'd like for you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew 12. We're going to look at verses 22 to 31. Matthew, excuse me, Luke 12. Luke 12. See the same story in Matthew is the same story in Luke. Luke 12, verses 22 to 31. Sorry. Jesus is speaking. Luke 12, verses 22 to 31. Then he said to his disciples, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, nor about the body, what you will put on, Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which have neither storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. How much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature, if you then are not able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? Verse 27, consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so closes the grass, which today is in the field and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he close you, O you of little faith? And do not seek 
what you should eat or what you should drink, nor have an anxious mind. For all of these things the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knows that you need these things. But seek the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added to you. What did Jesus say about faith? Jesus was on the hill, the Beatitudes we call this. He, we don't know what hill it was. He was on this hill. He was with his disciples. There's a lot of people. And you look at, I believe, Matthew 4, and it takes you to Matthew 7. And then we're looking at these scriptures in Luke, which is basically the same thing, talking about the Sermon on the Mount. He's speaking to his disciples. <clears throat> People all over the countryside, families. I believe there was flowers on those hills and there were birds flying around because he identified both of those. This setting. Jesus setting down. Speaking to them. A lot of things. The Beatitudes is something we need to study because it tells us about the kingdom. And what the nature of the kingdom is. What the kingdom of God is. So he's speaking here. As he's ending. And he's talking about. The main theme. What did Jesus say about faith. Or you could have another subtitle is. Don't worry. That's basically what he was saying. Don't worry. Verse 22 he says. <clears throat> Don't worry about your life. Don't be preoccupied. With the, with the food the drink, and the clothing. Because he said life is more than food and clothing. Life is more than being preoccupied with just the food and the clothing and the pursuing of things. And he tells us, look at the birds. And again, I believe people could see them flying around. The flowers. He said that ravens don't have a place to store their food. And yet God takes care of the birds. The flowers don't do anything to manufacture anything. They just exist and God has created them and takes care of them. And then he asked the question, aren't you more valuable than birds? And flowers? I mean, he really brought it down to a simple word. Aren't you more valuable? than birds and flowers. I say, yes, we are. I say we're more valuable to God. But this is, tells you something about the Father's love for even his creation. He provides. You know what I love uh, here in this area? is when the rains come, that in March and April, you begin to see all these hills full of all the poppies and all the colors. This whole area of, of southwest Riverside County, you see all the flowers coming out. And it's, it's beautiful to see. God is the one that arranged that for us. God knows that it'll come forth if it's watered. And the ravens. The other day I was driving up in my truck into my carport, and all of a sudden I see all these little, they probably were sparrows, on my backyard, and there's a bunch of them, and they're just going on the ground just like this. I thought, what are they, what are they doing? Are they, did they find worms? They were eating something. Of course, I scared them away. I didn't honk the horn. But they, they, were, they were eating because they had found something. A bunch of them. There must have been 20 of them. They flew away, and I'm sure they were going to come back. You think my dog, my little, would bark or do something, but... She doesn't have much teeth, so if she barks, she goes, boo. That's another story we won't get into. Our dog with no teeth. She has three, three teeth. Verse 25. He says, and which of you by worrying can add one cubit to his stature? He speaks to, about worrying about things. And he says, what will it accomplish in your life by worrying about things? The word worry, and this is something that perk your ears up. The word 
worry comes from the Greek word maranio, maranio, which means to divide in parts. The word worry means in the Greek to divide in parts. The word talks about a distraction, a preoccupation with things, causing anxiety, stress, and pressure. I want to say it again. The word means a distraction, a preoccupation with things causing in you an anxiety, a stress, and a pressure. Verse 25, Jesus is basically saying, can you add anything to your life? What can you add by worrying? And the answer is, can you add anything to your life by worrying? No. And you need to tell yourself that. I, I will not accomplish anything, add anything to my life by worrying. You can't add anything about your life by worrying. Verse 26, 26 he talked about, why are you anxious for the rest? Why are you anxious about these little things? Little things? That's a big thing. Clothes, food, what I'm going to drink. Let me tell you what worry does to you, how it applies to you. Number one, and I hope you're ready to write this down. If you don't need this, somebody needs this, I'll give it to you and you can write on it. What does worry, what does worry do to us? And what is the end result? Number one, it's unreasonable. Worry is just unreasonable. Because it's the opposite of the Father's care for us. It's unreasonable. It's the opposite of the Father's care for us. Number two, it's unnatural. All these are going to end with, uh, start with you. It's unnatural, verse 26. And the reason it's unnatural is man is the only one of God's creations that worries. Think about it. We are the only one of God's creation that worries. It's unnatural. Birds, flowers, God is going to take care of them. And it's a lesson that Jesus is talking about faith here. Number three, it's unhelpful. The reason it's unhelpful is because worry and anxiety don't produce anything workable in your life. Is this true? Worry does not produce anything worthwhile in your life. Nothing worthwhile. It's unhelpful. Number four, it's unnecessary. God says, I'll take care of my own and I will meet their needs. It is unnecessary because God says, I'll take care of my own and I'll meet their needs. Is this true? You're very quiet this morning. Number five, it's unbelieving. It's unbelieving. The reason it's unbelieving because we can act like God is not even around. True? We can act like God doesn't even exist when we live in fear or even financial fear. I saw something on the internet by John Bevere's wife, Lisa Bevere, who's a tremendous uh, woman of God who's written some tremendous books. And I, I had to go back to where it was on the internet of something she said and this is a quote from Lisa Bevere fear is the greatest rival of love fear is the greatest rival of love think about it it's equal in intensity and deadly to corrupt Want me to say it again? Fear 
is the greatest rival of love. God's love. Fear is the greatest rival of love and it's equal in intensity and deadly to corrupt. See, 1 John 4.18 says, Perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. And he who fears hath not been made perfect in love. I want to say that again because it's so powerful. This is 1 John 4.18. Perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. Because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. That's 1 John 4.18. God does not want you tormented. He does not want you tormented with fear or worrying and having anxiety about clothes, food, water, whatever. Verse 27 and 28, he talks about look at the flowers and the birds. And he even equates them to Solomon. Now Solomon was a was a we would call him a many times a billionaire and he had all the can you imagine the clothes that Solomon had and yet Jesus is saying that not even Solomon with all the money he had and all the changes of clothes he had was not even dressed as beautiful as the flowers of the field you know why because it was supernatural provision the clothes were made by man and they were expendable. But the flowers were supernatural that God made them grow. What is it saying to you? God makes the provision supernaturally for you. Super, listen, God wants you to know it's not the social security. It's not your retirement check. It's not where you work that we put our trust in. Our trust is in God alone. I have said this, and it's funny, Some, a lot of Christians put more faith in the postman than they do God. And he says there, if God, verse 28, so closes the grass, and today it's in the field, and they mow it down, and it's thrown into the oven, how much more will he close you? And he uses the word, O oh, you of little faith. Little faith. It means that the faith that's not being used. It's a faith that's kept small because you're not willing to take risk. One of the things we've been learning in this healing series on Wednesday night is that what we are praying for in private and believing Jesus in private, we are asking God that we're willing to take risk in public. Hello? Hello? Think about it. God wants you to trust him and not live in fear and anxiety, but willing to take risk. You know what taking risk is, and if I might just say it in a practical sense, when you walked up here to put your tithes and wrote it or give, that was taking a risk of faith and a statement of faith and saying to yourself, what it goes out of my hand goes into God's hands and God is a multiplier. God is a multiplier. O oh, you of little faith. You know, there were four times that Jesus used this term, O oh, you of little faith. Four times in the gospel, Jesus used this term, O oh, you of little faith. One of them was Peter when Peter said, Lord, if it's you out, you know, they're out in the, the boat and Jesus is walking towards them and you all know the story. Lord, if it's you, bid me come. Jesus said, come. And Peter walked on the water. But here's the, here's the story with that. When he began, the Bible says, to look at all the winds and the waves, he became afraid. And he began, to, he didn't sink, he began to sink. And Jesus took him by the hand, got him in the boat and said, why did you doubt? Why did you doubt me? 
I believe God is saying that to you today. Why do you doubt me? And I believe those words, oh, you have little faith. Verse 29. He talked about having an anxious mind. Let's take me back to the anxious mind about worry and fear. Verse 30. He says, and this is God's promise, people are preoccupied with getting their stuff. They're just preoccupied with it. What am I going to wear? What am I going to eat? What am I going to play? What am I going to do? You know, it's like their whole world is preoccupied with me, 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 me. The reason that the Lord wants us to trust him is that if your mind is preoccupied with fear and anxiety, you can't think on the see the greatness of God and do the work of the kingdom because you're so preoccupied with what am I going to wear? What am I going to eat? What am I going to drink? What am I going to do? It's just well, I'm preoccupied with it. And I'm anxious and I'm fearful and my mind's not free to hear the instructions from heaven and live, listen, to live in freedom without anxiety and fear. How many here understand what I'm saying? Because we're so preoccupied. <clears throat> and we're anxious and we're fearful and we say and do things that is totally against the character of your God that you say you serve. Whoa, did you hear that? We'll say and do things because we're not believing what God said of who he is to you. A father. You're a good, good father. It's who I am. It's who you are. Come on. Is it true? For all these things, the nations of the world or the Gentiles or the unbelievers, listen, the unbelievers seek after. And this is the promise. And your father knows that you need these things. God knows what you need. Every one of you, he knows what you need. And he's saying, don't live in fear. Don't live in anxiety. Don't live in that place anymore. It is his lordship that he is lord of it all. And when we surrender everything to God and enter into that place of intimacy with him as a born-again believer, then take trust today. Don't live in fear and anxiety that somehow that God can save your soul, but he can't take care of your needs. Are you hearing this today? Don't live in fear and anxiety. I want you to go to a scripture in Philippians 4 and verses 4 to 7 we're going to look at. This is a wonderful promise from God's word from the Apostle Paul to this church. And it talks about the lifestyle that we should live and in instruction. Philippians 4 verses 4 to 7. In fact, if Susan, could you put that up on the Philippians, the fourth chapter, verses 4 and 7. I want to just take a moment because this has got some rich instruction for us this morning. It's a tremendous promise. Look what it says. In fact, let's read it together, everybody. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, I'm going to start over. Verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. That's powerful. And he starts off by saying, live a life of rejoicing. Rejoicing. Why should I rejoice? Why should I worship and I praise God? Because I belong to him. And this is all temporary. Amen? 
It's all temporary. I belong to him, and I'm going to rejoice and enjoy the presence of my God for who he is and who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am. The life of a worshiper is not a church thing. It's a 24-7, 365 thing for the believer. Rejoice, he says. Worship and praise. Declare and be confident. Hallelujah. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. And then he says, again, I say rejoice. Hallelujah. Man, I feel like the church is waking up this morning. Then he says, let your gentleness be known to all men. And he's talking about, let the character of Jesus be seen in you, even of the gentleness of, of a, a strength. Listen, the word meekness or gentleness means this. It means strength under discipline. It means having strength in God and it's under the control of the Holy Spirit. I'll take that. Amen? How many want that? That strength under discipline. Let your, let your gentleness be known to all men. See, it's the character of Jesus in you. Let all men see it. The Lord is at hand. He's coming. We need to declare as we see these days getting darker and darker that the Lord is in control. He's got you where he wants you to be. And he's got, he knows what he's doing in your life. And again, he prepares a table before me, before my what? My enemies. Hallelujah. Have you got a hold of that yet this morning? Psalm 23. He prepares a table. Well, look what it says in verse 6. Here's that word again. Be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Be anxious for nothing. Not worried, not fearful. 1 Peter 5, 7 says this, casting all of your care upon him. Write it down, 1 Peter 5, 7. Casting all of your care upon him. Another word for care is the word, hear me, anxiety. Casting all of your anxiety upon him. Who's to him? Jesus. And then it says in that verse, because he cares for you. Be anxious for nothing. But look what it says there. By our prayers and by our intercession, with combined with worship and with thanksgiving to God. You know, sometimes you shouldn't even ask God for anything. Well, before you ask God for anything, you just need to say, Lord, I thank you that I'm alive today. I thank you that you have got my day planned out for me today. I'm so glad that I have strength to praise you. I can see and I can hear and I'm walking. And you provided on my table what I'm going to eat. And you're taking care of me. And God, I'm thankful that my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I'm so thankful for the blood of Jesus. I'm thankful that I'm not the tail, I'm the head and I'm going forward. And look out, devil, here I come. Just begin to praise him and thank him. So in the atmosphere of being thankful, make your request known to God. He says, let everything by prayer, bring your petitions to God. Mix it with thanksgiving, which talks about a thankful heart. Make your request known by God. Listen, why? He's listening. God is listening. And the people who get their prayers answered are the one who prays their way into the throne room. Did you hear that just now? The people that get their prayers answered are the worshipers and the ones that are thankful to God. Because it's, it's, it's just realizing the place of humility and the place for a grateful heart. That is where faith comes. That brings you into the entrance of his presence. Are you getting this this morning? Look what he has promised. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, is going to guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. He's going to guard you emotionally. He's going to guard the inner person in you. It's his peace. The Bible says the natural man doesn't understand the things of God. Neither can he know them. But for us who have been born again, 
who are a child of the kingdom that belong to Jesus, we have the peace. And so when his peace is released in us, it guards our emotions, it guards our body, and it guards this thing up here, your mind. Your mind is going to be at peace. Peace that the world can't buy. All the money in the world can't buy God's peace. All the fame, all the whatever cannot bring peace. It's supernatural. It's supernatural. Amen? The natural man cannot understand it. Only those that are born again can understand and receive the peace of God. He will guard my heart. He will guard my mind. And you know what? I will have a joyful, peaceful disposition. You know why? What did verse 4 say? Rejoice, and then I say again, rejoice. I'm rejoicing, I'm praying, I'm worshiping, I'm thankful, and I have confidence because my God is ready to answer my prayers. That's what God has for us. Worship team, come back up here, you that are here. Come back up here. I just want us to leave as I finish up this message today. Jesus Christ, our Lord, trust Him, praise Him, take risk in faith, and we are to expect supernatural provision. Carol and I got a little chuckle the other day. You know the prayer we prayed about finding money, bills paid off, all that? We got out of the car, we're going to Stater Brothers. She finds some money on the ground. First thing out of her mouth is, Finding money. Well, that's just, that's just, that could have happened to anybody. Not for the person of faith. Not for the person who's believed that everything he has comes from God. Finding money, bills paid off, bills decreased. Maybe I ought to give that to you and you can just memorize that prayer. People have said before, why do you pray that prayer? I said, because it works. Well, why do you have to tell God that? Because I need to be specific when I pray. If you'll be religious, you won't get it. Little faith can be made into big faith. And let me say this, and it was shared at the teaching. Faith is not a doctrine or a teaching. It's the gospel. Faith is the gospel. It's not a doctrine or you've come up with some type of thing. Faith is the gospel. It's just... The whole package. See, when you accept the Jesus and I accept the Jesus, we got the whole package. And a lot of people fight, struggle inside about the whole package, about the gospel. So we got to believe God for it all. If I want all of these blessings, I got to receive all of these commandments too. Amen? I can't compartmentalize. It's kind of like, well, I believe in seven of the Ten Commandments. If you which one, you know? Your, oh, your choice, of course. Let's stand together. Let's worship the Lord. Amen? And I want to say this. If you need prayer, we got pastors and leaders right here to pray for you and come into agreement to agree with your faith that God is a God that does the supernatural. Let's pray to well, I've heard a thousand stories of what they think your life but I heard the tender whispers of love in the dead of night and you tell me that you're pleasing that I'm never alone your good good father who you are
God 
is God and does not change. We are his kids. And again, if God loves and takes care of birds and flowers, how much more will he take care of us? And he chides us, oh, you have little faith. Well, we might have little faith, or you might feel this morning like you have just a little faith. But if you take those steps to worship and pray and believe, and realize that fear and anxiety and worry does not belong to you. And win the war by your in your mind. Win the war in your mind. How do you win the war in your mind? I refuse to have anxiety. I have refused to have worry. And I refuse it because I'm believing what God has said. And he hears and he answers. And you have a testimony that you stood in faith believing. Even for the little things like food and clothing and all those things. Amen? So lift up your heads today. I want to say this. We close. We have something to do that's not spiritual, but we need to do it to bring honor. It's Glenn and Andy's birthday today. So we're going to sing. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Glenn and Andy. Happy birthday to you. Amen. God bless you. If you would like prayer for anything, come up here. We'll see you tonight at 5. We'll see you Wednesday night right in here for the healing time of teaching. God bless you.